God. Um, so I am per personally, uh, my dad is a World War II vet, and this is a very, you know, I'm, I am personally very uh, moved by uh, Roger Sterling's war, and also about how you handle that, because it's never super major thing. It's always a second or third subplot, but um, we're going to look at two clips. You so have to think about a society. We had, I think, what was it, an 11 million person army by the end of World War II? So you're, you're, you're talking about a huge percent of the percentage of the population right. that has been involved in the war. But Roger was there for the duration. Yes. And well, everyone able, was there for the duration, but, but Roger been there, was there for a very long time. He was time, in yes. the Pacific a long time. And, and, and we know there's trauma. We just don't know a lot of details about it. There's one night where he comes over to have dinner with um, Don and Betty, where he talks a little bit about it. And yeah. then there's some other things. But then in, in Gypsy and Hobo, uh, he, Annabelle shows up, which is his former girlfriend from the 1930s. Yeah. They were in Paris together. Yes. And she wants to rekindle the flame, ex-flame. And we're going to look at Her that. Her husband's dead now. Her husband died. Yeah. She inherited the father's dog food company. Right. Roger was in love with her. I think we can probably leave it at that. Yeah. Um, this, right after that, we're going to a another Roger clip from season four, episode five, but we're jumping, forgive us, to a very important episode, Chrysanthemum and Sword, which is the Honda comes over, mm -hmm. and Roger takes what he considers to be a principled stand against dealing with the Japanese co company. And at the end of that episode, Joan comes into his office, and Roger is feeling sorry for himself. And they have a conversation about how he feels about dealing with the Japanese. Yes, and the, the, the only thing that's important to know is that this is 1960, well, the, the first one is, is uh, Gypsy and the Hobo, I think it takes place since 1962, and I think the Honda one is 1965. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about uh, 1996 for us. That's important. That's the thing that you forget when you're in a historical drama is what 20 years is. It's nothing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, Gypsy and Hobo and Chrysanthemum and Sword, two short clips. So the 1930s. Right. It's, it's mad, you know, Mad Men talks about the 30s a lot, surprisingly. Right, the Don's experience in the Depression, yeah. it's, homelessness, it's a, hobos. It's the most, I mean, uh, the 20s are frequently seen as the most corollary to the 60s because of all of the uh, licentiousness. And high hilarity. And high hilarity. Um, but uh, the 30s is, the, is the, you know, the moment of uh, where America was on the verge of a revolution. And then the war... And we did have a, a uh, elected revolution, a political revolution, as some people say. The New Deal. The New Deal. And um, Franklin Roosevelt, the last person in the world anyone expected to bring socialism to the United States. Um, I mean, you know, in, in the world, you have to remember Hitler, Stalin, Churchill, Roosevelt, they all have the same problem in 1933. And they all solve it with deficit spending only... Roosevelt is filled with, with also with social programs for artists, and you know, I I think this was a big moment of impact. And then the war came, and there's a kind of um, forced equality, which many people believe that the war itself was an economic you know thing that brought us out of the Great Depression. But the, what's, I just think it had a huge impact in these people's lives and. Uh, America seemed a lot more open. You know, there, you see movies from the early 30s, uh, the early talkies before the code that are very modern, very contemporary. You see conversations that people are still having about sex, about drugs. Some of it is scandalous. Some of it is, you know, for the wrong reasons, but it's all there. So I love the idea that this was looming in their lives and that they kind of missed out on the cool part of Paris for sure. And Roger and Annabelle, in the 30s, not the 20s, as she yeah. reminds us, went to Paris, where the dollar was strong, where after a while, we don't have the dates, but fascism is on the rise. Yeah. And she remembers it one way, and he now, who, he who is usually very uh, unrespo irresponsible, what's the word? Not, not uh, he's, his, his memory is not accurate. Reliable. Reliable, sorry. Um, he 
is this is a sober, mature moment, a rare one for Roger. Uh, He's fidel is it? fidelity to Jane for the moment. Is he resists he, her entreaties. Is he just like, you rejected me, you don't get this? No, I don't I know how. I don't know. I don't know if he's really just drawing a line in the sand and saying this is the way it's going to be. You don't Matt, get everything you want. I think it's more. Let me try it. Sure. So, I mean, you were going there already, but no. It's the '30s. He says, "Look, you can remember it as Casablanca like." But I fought the war for the duration and, and married Mona, then went to the Pacific. It was horrible. And I came back and I got a job and I worked. Yeah. And I had to make all those compromises. And I'm like, I'm post-war guy in a, f it's a flannel suit. It may be an expensive flannel suit, but he is constrained by that. He made mature decisions that GIs did when they came home. And she's flouncing around doing mm -hmm. a dat with daddy's uh, dog food. Thing. I think he and definitely he's feels misremembering he, grew, the he 30s. grew up and she didn't. Definitely. Um, it wasn't Casablanca. It wasn't Casablanca, but <laughs> I couldn't resist the dog food joke. Um, there, the dog food thing was actually a big crisis at that point. There's a, in the movie The Misfits, which I don't know if it ever got released, but was a, the story was about a horse farm that was going out of business because all the horses were. America was scandalized by the fact that there was horse meat and dog food. Um, I, I have, I've, I've just expressed my opinion on that. Um, but uh, I also love the idea that she was using as an excuse to get close to him again. I also have to say, just like from a, from a production standpoint, I remember having this conversation uh, that they were supposed to talk loud, as people do when they're drunk, and he, the, the thing with the arm was sort of in the script, but they did it so well that she wouldn't allow him to put her coat on for her. And when you give business like that, they're just so it's really adorable an and an amazing scene, and it's yeah. shot beautifully. Um, uh, Jennifer Getzinger directed that. And I just remember thinking, like, you always worry when you cut from two characters to two characters later, it has to be drastic enough in, in frame and, and subject matter and mood that it actually doesn't bump the audience or jar them. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think you see, every once in a while, <clears throat> I was fighting against this, this movieized, as I am with a lot of history, this movieized version of uh, American history. And we're in it again yeah. right now. Um, you know, it's, it's... And how remarkable Things get you... metabolized in the most... Um, history's written by the winners. I, what are the cliches that go with it? But it gets metabolized in such a politically serving way. And I used to think that it was an external thing, that there was some like force out there that was basically designed to make us think that JFK was a saint, for example, um, and that America lost its innocence that day when you know the basic premise of the show is America was never innocent. And then you have people even talking just about the show, forget about American history, and saying, like, we look back to Mad Men and a, and a simpler time. Those days are gone. I'm like, what? frame of this show ever suggested that it was simpler or, or you know, or even a long time ago. So it, it, that is, that, I think Roger is there as a mouthpiece for me, basically, really? to say in some way, uh, you got it wrong. Right. And history that, is different. History is different. Um, you've, you're a spoiled brat who never had to face any responsibilities. Right. And the reason why I corrected you on the duration thing is that it's hard for people to understand, but that, that was a point of pride for these guys because after that there were terms for military service of two year stint or whatever. In World War II, you went in, if that war had lasted as long as Afghanistan, this, well, I mean, not that these people aren't doing multiple terms and that, that's not worth, you know, an, an, that's another problem. But there was a belief that more than 200 days in combat made you psychotic. There were, there were all these statistics about it, but they were in, you were in after Pearl Harbor. If you signed up after Pearl Harbor, even if it was at your dad's insistence, not everybody was rushing to, to, to be part of it, by the way. Um, you were in until it ended. And in fact, after the bomb was dropped, you were aware of this, there were riots at the idea that we were not, that the, the troops were not being disbanded quickly enough. And when we did the story about Don Draper, who goes AWOL in between the wars, the Chinese crossed the parallel in that, in that episode. That's the beginning of the Korean War. There, when, when I had a, a, an army consultant about the possibility of this, which I knew was possible because someone told me the story, um, 
you know, the army line is like, that's impossible. Everybody's being supervised. We had this here. We had that here. We had this here. And I was like, here's the statistic. There's more soldiers that disappeared between the end of World War II and the Korean War mm -hmm. because they were being, their deployment was being moved. They were just like, forget it. So. You're retelling history two ways there. One is to say that the convention of the boring, suburbanized, tranquilized, 50s, gray flannel yeah. suit guy has to be modified by the experience of someone like Roger, who is de-romanticizing the 30s and saying, I fought for the duration, I got a job, and you're wrong in thinking it was romantic. Um, uh, and it's funny, because you'd use the first clip, too. Is, isn't Paul Fussell a professor here? He's he deceased. Was? Oh. Yeah. But he was I'm not going years, to visit right? him. Jim English and I were his I colleagues. Did not, I did not know that. The uh, War and Modern Memory. That, also I read that, that, and that in high school. And the, war, and the, and the book about crusade. World War II, which is about how boring World War II That's was. That's the, bo the Boys' Crusade, isn't yeah. it what it's called? I don't or? think it's called that, but World War II book. Uh, the World War II book has uh, an amazing thing in it, which is a, he's, con he's, a, he's a, the, one of the great revisionist historians, and he did this great thing called The Great War and Modern Memory about World War I, which is where all the language that we have right now he makes a, a very convincing argument that it's the birth of black humor. It's the source of all of our and irony, uh, uh, irony, irony. Uh, anti-authoritarianism. I mean, everything right. that writers love is born in the trenches. So Roger, and, I'm sorry. But, uh, just, just along these no, lines. Please. And when you read his book about World War II, it's not just about how boring it is. It's about the difference between, um, I will you know, say this is a very unpopular opinion, but the difference between um, Saving Private Ryan not that the D-Day uh, part of it isn't incredibly accurate to everyone, but the whole attitude of the way that soldiers are depicted um, versus what we have here uh, in the United States is an extremely subversive culture, extremely subversive culture. And just imagine drafting people and putting them in the army and depriving them of Oreos and home and women. And all you can see is that like, that the, my favorite thing very quickly is he tells a story in there the Germans had a plan in the Battle of the Bulge to divert American troops by taking everyone in Germany, in the German army who had ever been in America, who spoke English, putting them in American uniforms they'd stolen, putting them in American Jeeps, and then having them drive and <laughs> move all the road signs. And they made a couple of mistakes. Now, this is where, like, who, which team plays in Brooklyn, whether they would try and test, like, are you really an American or not? They made a couple of mistakes. Number one is Americans, they put, the, they put them four to a Jeep and had them driving around. Number one, American soldiers were never in uniform. <laughs> they were always in fatigues and looked horrible. They were called slouches. Number two, despite the fact that the entire war was done on gasoline, American soldiers never rode more than one person in a Jeep. <laughs> so they had four soldiers in there. And number three, this is, tells you more about Germany, but there is a, uh, the Americans had an ID card that had an uncorrected typo in it, identification card. And the Germans, when they copied it, corrected the typo. <laughs> but I just love that depiction of the American soldiers. Are you saying that Steven Spielberg didn't, didn't present history accurately? I'm saying that he, yes. Oh, that's what you're saying. And that's I'm so saying, relevant to this conversation about is. Mad Men. Yes. This is Roger's background. So then he takes a strong stand against working with Honda, which is a silly view. I mean, as, as Pete says, uh, if Bernbach is willing to work with Volkswagen, is it? Yeah. If the Jewish agencies were TDB willing, was, to, it was was was. Then uh, why can't then anyone can take Honda, and Roger walks out, and later Joan comes in, and they have that amazing conversation. Yeah. What should we say about that conversation? Uh, I liked it because Roger's clearly constantly pontificating about these stories and telling the war stories the way the veterans did. Um, uh, and it's almost a cliche of my childhood that anybody who was, uh, obviously they needed to talk about it, but she, her husband's going to Vietnam and she's just she like... She needs to believe, she that, needs to he believe made, that World War II succeeded World in War II the World War II made safe. the world a safer place. And I think, um, I think that's a lot of what perpetuates wars, actually. So, If you had allowed Roger to tell the story, the untold story of Private First Class Bryson, who was an honest-to-goodness poet, it would have been less of a scene. She cuts him off. Yeah. I don't want to hear... He's bearing witness. He said earlier to Honda, when they were talking about Honda, I made a promise to all these guys. Right. That I would not... That I would stand up for their memories. Bryson is obviously one of those. He doesn't get to tell the story. No, he doesn't. But I also... No, he doesn't. I, I don't remember if I ever wrote it and cut it and just thought that that was more dramatic, but I think, 
a certain point, you always have the dramatic rule that overcomes things where it's like, yeah, you want the audience to hear it, but come on, it's Roger and Joan. There's no way he hasn't told her this story before. And uh, Greg is going to Vietnam, which is a different war, obviously. Yes. But I was thinking about, about the way these things are perpetuated and the stories that are told. And, you know, fighting a war, especially World War II, um, any war requires so much propaganda of dehumanization of the enemy, uh, where you literally don't even regard their children as children. Otherwise, you can't do it. You can't drop bombs on a city where you can see cars driving around. I mean, you know, I, I had a professor in college tell the story about dropping bombs. Oh, he, was, he dropped bombs on Dresden, um, and he said the glee with which we dropped these bombs. That is a product of a very concentrated advertising campaign to convince you that the enemy is not human. I'm not saying that the enemy, that Nazi Germany, you know, didn't deserve it, and we know a lot of what Dresden was about, which is like, stop destroying shit, that you've lost the war, it's over. But I think Roger has to face the fact that uh, we have to kiss and make up. And how we expected people 20 years after that to do that is remarkable. And, you know, we did it. There's, some of this is about how amazing America is. Um, you know, I, 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 I tried to make that part of the show, this idea of, like, whether it's Conrad Hilton or, you know, American imperialism, uh, cultural imperialism, which is now regarded as the scourge of the earth, whether it's Elvis or Mad Men or whatever. Or Coke. Or Coke. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's part of, it's always an extension of the Marshall Plan. And it's always... Creating markets. Yes. Creating markets, but also um, these are based on whatever we perceive to be democracy. And it was done at great expense. So I, whether it worked or not, fine, we can have that debate. Was our heart in the right place? Yes. yes. Is our heart in the right place when it comes to the, inter to the world? I still believe it is. I believe what you've done with Roger is um, profound. You've taken him in season three, taking a mature position of fidelity to Jane, although he's not, that doesn't last very long. He really with thinks he's gonna. Yeah. He says with that, Annabelle I really liked you. <laughs> saying, look, history isn't that way. I'm not gonna romanticize. I'm also not gonna have a, f f you, you threw me away, and the 30s wasn't like that. And it wasn't the 20s, it was the 30s. Fascism was on the rise. This is what happened. Then the next season, he takes an immature and irresponsible position with respect to Honda. But because we saw the season before, we're going to listen a little longer to his mm -hmm. intemperate view of the Honda executives. Yeah. And that's really important. And Joan really likes him or says, look, you're feeling sorry for yourself, but go ahead and talk. But he can't quite tell the story of PFC Bryson, yeah. that, that poet. Yeah. That's good stuff, Matt. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.